Let's pray. And Father, we do love you and thank you for your great love and grace and mercy. We thank you, Father, for the joy of knowing you, that you have revealed yourself to us through Jesus and through the prophets and through your word and through each other. And I pray, Father, you speak to us this morning. Draw us to you. Open our eyes to your word. Speak to us. Encourage us. Convict us. Help us to realize the awesomeness of who you are and the awesomeness of your plan that I think is about to be unveiled on the world soon with the end times. Again, open our minds to what you're saying. Give us discernment and wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Back in chapter 13, the prophecy began to be statements of the wrath of God coming on pretty much everybody. Everybody that had any contact with Israel or Judah were mentioned from the Philistines to Assyria to Babylon to Egypt. They were all listed out. God's wrath is coming on them for their arrogance, their pride, their treatment of Israel, God's people, their rejection of God as God. It's a, a long stretch of doom and gloom, basically. It's just your end is near. In chapter 24, you think there'd be a break at some point, but chapter 24 turns into not only will these local nations be destroyed, the whole world will be destroyed. <laughs> so it goes from worse to worse to horribly worse because now the prophet is saying everybody is going to experience the wrath of God. Chapter 24 through 27 are like an interlude. There's this final statement of total destruction. Then there's one of God reigns and God's people rejoice and worship God in 25, 26, and 27. The commentators, and I'm beginning to think they're about as useful as nothing, think this doesn't belong in Isaiah, it wasn't written by Isaiah, so the editor just stuck it in there for no reason whatsoever. They want to pull it out and throw it away, which is why I don't buy many commentaries, because they think that their opinion is fact, when in reality they're as lost as can be, literally, spiritually, as lost as can be. Uh, the... The text belongs here. It's a nice break of the wrath of God being poured out with the positive, 25, 26, 27. Then it goes back to addressing Israel and Judah and their rebellion and God's wrath coming on them before it goes back into the history of what's happening with Assyria at the gates of Jerusalem. So we will look at it in that context. The context is it's a whole bunch of the wrath of God being poured out but then the final, the end of all time, God is glorified and God is worshipped. And Jesus, is, Jesus reigns for a thousand years here on earth, in Jerusalem, on Mount Zion. So that's how it's being presented. So we will do chapter 24 and look at it closely because it matches Matthew 24 and Matthew's revelation with end time descriptions and events and what's happening. I'm going to read all 24 at one time so you get the whole impact. Behold, the Lord lays the earth waste, devastates it, distorts its surface, and scatters its inhabitants. And the people will be like the priest, the servant like his master, the maid like her mistress, the buyer like the seller, the lender like the borrower, the creditor like the debtor. The earth will be completely laid waste and completely despoiled, for the Lord has spoken his word. The earth mourns and withers the world fades and withers. The exalted of the people of the earth fade away. The earth is also polluted by its inhabitants, for they transgressed laws, violated statutes, broke the everlasting covenant. Therefore a curse devours the earth, and those who live in it are held guilty. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men are left. The new wine mourns, the vine decays, all the merry-hearted sigh. The gaiety of tambourines ceases, the noise of revelers stops. The gaiety of the harp ceases. They do not drink wine with song. Strong drink is bitter to those who drink it. The city of chaos is broken down. Every house is shut up so that none may enter. There is an outcry in the streets concerning the wine. All joy turns to gloom. The gaiety of the earth is banished. Desolation is left in the city, and the gate is battered to ruins. For thus it will be in the midst of the earth among the peoples, and the shaking of an olive tree, as the shaking of an olive tree, as the gleaning when the grapes harvest is over. They raise their voices, they shout for joy, they cry, cry out 
from the west concerning the majesty of the Lord. Therefore glorify the Lord in the east, the name of the Lord, the God of Israel, in the coastlands of the sea. From the ends of the earth we hear songs, glory to the righteous one. But I say, woe to me, woe to me, alas for me, the treacherous deal treacherously, and the treacherous deal very treacherously. Terror and pit and snare confront you, O inhabitant of the earth. Then it will be that he who flees the report of disaster will fall into the pit, and he who climbs out of the pit will be caught in the snare. For the windows above are opened, and the foundations of the earth shake. The earth is broken asunder, the earth is split through, the earth is shaken violently, the earth reels to and fro like a drunkard, and it totters like a shack, for its transgressions is heavy upon it, and it will fall never to rise again. So it will happen in that day that the Lord will punish the host of heaven on high and the kings of the earth on earth. They will be gathered together like prisoners in the dungeon and will be confined in prison. And after many days they will be punished. Then the moon will be abashed and the sun ashamed for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and his glory will be before his elders. And you read all at one time and there's no break. It's one long statement of the earth will be destroyed. The people on it will be destroyed. And it ends with many will be cast into prison for many days and then brought out to be judged and punished. Well, let's look at it in a little more detail. And the Hebrew language is great about creating word pictures. And this chapter is awesome with, with doing that, creating the word pictures. Verses 1 and 2. There will be no distinction between social or race or anything among people. They're all the same, all suffer together. Whether you're a seller or a buyer, a king or a servant or whatever, you will suffer equally when the time comes. And that's the point. No one will escape the wrath of God when it comes at this point. Uh, verses 3 through the beginning of verse 4. The whole wor world will suffer God's wrath. Completely laid waste. Completely despoiled. Uh, the Lord has spoken. You can't change the fact it's going to happen because God has said it. Uh, nothing man does can stop what's coming. The earth mourns and withers. The world fades and withers. It's a complete destruction. Again, worldwide, global destruction. Not just a few nations around Israel, but the whole world suffers. The earth is polluted by its inhabitants. Verse 5, and that's a great statement. And the reality is what makes the earth what it is in a negative way is people. People who rebel against God, reject God. And he says, they, broke the, they transgressed laws, violated statutes, broke the everlasting covenant. And, and I, it's a complete statement of everything that God gave man to be held accountable to, man had rejected. Even the ultimate one, the everlasting covenant, which is God is God and there is no other. God is our Savior and there is no other. So humanity's issue, the reason they are being punished and face the wrath of God, is because they have rejected God as God and Jesus as their Savior. It's not a real hard thing to figure out. Verse 6 through 23, the curse devours the earth. Verse 6, those who live in it are held guilty, are burned. Few men are left. Read Revelation. It's a very similar description of end times, which is why I think it is the same description of the same event. It's end times. 7 through 13, the curse. There is no new wine. What they have is bitter, is old. And, and the idea is, there should be a time of celebration with the new wine when it is it is picked, it is smashed, it is harvested. And, and, and one commentator suggests the new wine is not alcohol-based wine, but literally just grape juice. When they go out and they get the harvest in and they, they tread the grapes, it's not fermented. It's just grape juice. Even that is not good. Fresh off the vine is not good. It's the point he's trying to make. So there is no celebration. There is no cause for celebrating because there is no new wine. Uh, in verse 8, there are no celebrations. The gaiety of tambourine ceases. The noise of revelers stops. The gaiety of the harp ceases. And the idea, again, is there's nothing to rejoice about, nothing to be happy about. It's all doom and gloom. If this is end times, and I believe it is, the rapture has already occurred. The Holy Spirit has removed his presence from earth. There is no joy here. And they are experiencing that. Every house is shut, either abandoned or locked inside. You don't want to come outside for fear of your life. 
Verse 11, all joy turns to gloom. Verse 13, again, it's end time. For this it will be in the midst of the earth among the peoples at the shaking of an olive tree and the gleaning of grapes. It's a worldwide event. The wrath of God is poured out on all men for their arrogance, their pride, and their rejection of God. Verses 14 through 16, you would think, well, they repent. They worship God. They rejoice. They raise their voices, they shout for joy, they cry out from the west concerning the majesty of the Lord. However, when you get down to the end of verse 16, but I say, woe to me, woe to me, alas for me, the treacherous deal treacherously, and the treacherous deal very treacherously. The idea is, it's false worship. They think in their moment of gloom and doom and no hope whatsoever, oh, we must turn to God. They will with their lips, but not with their heart. Ezekiel 31, he describes, Ezekiel does the exact event of the people of Jerusalem as Jerusalem falls. Oh, now you want to turn to God and worship God. You do it with your lips, but there's no heart surrender. There's no salvation. There's no submission to God as God. And that's the idea here. There will be some fake response, some <coughs> fake, oh, yeah, God's God. I, I changed my mind. But the heart never turns, which is why he says, woe is me. He is calling them out for their false worship, their false piety. He's acknowledging you have no idea what it means to turn to God because you're not. Verses 17 through 18, there'll be no escape. And I like the way he does this. Terror and pit and snare. If you escape one, the other one gets you. There's no hope. So I moved to Birmingham to go to school many years ago. I heard a story about a guy up the road from the college, the university. He was working on something in a tractor at a house in the yard and he hit the gas line. And he realized what he had done. He got off the tractor and ran down the driveway, which was a hill, to escape the coming explosion. He had to bomb the driveway and was going so fast he couldn't stop. Right road, hit by a car. <laughs> he escaped one, but the next one got him. And that's the picture here in this text. You may escape the pit, but the snare's going to get you. There is no escape from the wrath of God. When the time comes, it's either repentance or wrath of God. And then 19 through 23, now the earth is destroyed. 19 and 20 do a great job describing an earthquake. Don't you think? The earth is broken asunder. The earth is split through. The earth is shaken violently. And then like 20, the, the word picture, the earth reels to and fro like a drunkard. A staggering drunkard, well, that's the earth staggering back and forth in the earthquake. Uh, it totters like a shack when the earth is shaking. So definitely there are earthquakes. And we know both in Matthew 24 and Revelation, it talks about earthquakes coming at the beginning of end times. And Isaiah is describing the same thing. Uh, verse, the end of verse 20, never to rise again. If we take that verse literally, which I do, there's no other <coughs> event in human history where the earth is so destroyed it never rises again until the end. Correct? So I, I read the text and I'm convinced that Isaiah is describing tribulation. Actually, the end of tribulation, right before Christ's thousand-year reign begins, his millennial reign begins at the end of tribulation. Again, verse 21, the whole world, the whole, all creation is destroyed. In verse 22, the evil are put in prison to be released at a later date to be judged, to be punished. That is exactly what Revelation says. At the beginning of Christ's thousand-year reign, deem, Satan is demons. All those that are evil, that rejected God, are put in the pit. And there they stay for a thousand years. At the end of a thousand years, they are released and defeated and judged by God, thrown to the bottomless pit where there is never an escape, and it's done. It's over with. Everything's destroyed. New heaven, new earth. We reign with Christ forever and ever. So Isaiah is saying the same thing. They are in prison for a, thousand, they're in prison for a short time, then released. And that is referring to the thousand year reign of Christ. I believe. That's what the text is saying. I think God reveals to Isaiah end time events. Of the tribulation, the imprisonment of those who reject Jesus, the thousand year reign of Christ is there, as well as the destruction, the wrath of God being poured out on man during tribulation. Put that in the context where it is in Isaiah. It's this long list of God's wrath on nations, and then well, let's just be blunt about it. The whole world's going to suffer God's wrath because of man's arrogance, pride, and rejection of Jesus. So the picture is. If you're reading Isaiah's prophecy, if he's speaking to you is, woe is me. We're done. We're toast. There is no hope. And that's part of the point of the text. 
is to help us to realize mm. we are done. We have no hope save for God. Mm. Our only hope is God. Assyria can't stop this. Babylon can't stop this. Egypt can't stop this. NATO can't stop this. No one can stop what God is going to do. He is God. His plan will be completed. And his wrath is coming on this world. We went to a football game Friday night with William at Ponte Vedra. It was their homecoming. The homecoming king and queen. I'm not sure if the king was a girl or the queen was a guy. The way they were dressed and acted, that's the way it was perceived. And that's the way it looked. And everybody was very excited and happy about that. That is our country. That is our world. <coughs> God's wrath is coming on this world that has so mocked him and rejected him and perverted itself against him. It's coming. And that's what the prophet is saying here. He lines it up. He lays it out where you can't miss the fact it's going to be bad. And it's going to be miserable. And then in chapter 25... He changes the tune to God's people rejoice. And the reality is, God's people never face the wrath of God. Now, Israel and Ju Judah were God's people, but those who faced the wrath of God, they were Hebrew, were the ones who rejected God, worshipped the Baals and false gods, in their arrogance denied God as God. God's people were the ones, the remnant, who did not worship the false gods, kneel to the false gods. Those he removed and put in Babylon in exile for their safekeeping and safety while he poured out his wrath on those who rejected him and denied him as God, even though they were Hebrew. The wrath of God is never poured out on God's people. He always removes us. He removed Noah. He removed these people. He will remove us at the rapture before tribulation. Chapter 25 is God's people rejoice when all this is done. So he lays out this bleak picture of destruction of God's wrath, but then he says, but if you are one of God's people who surrender to him, this is where you end up. And it's chapter 25. Uh, God is exalted in his work, beginning in verse 1. O oh Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will give thanks to your name, for you have worked wonders, plans formed long ago with perfect faithfulness. For you have made a city into a heap, a fortified city into a ruin, a palace of strangers is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, a strong people will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will revere you. For you have been a defense for the helpless and defense for the needy. In his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a rainstorm against a wall. Like heat and droughts, you subdue the uproar of aliens. Like heat by the shadow of a cloud, the song of the ruthless is silenced. The Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on, the, on this mountain, a banquet of aged wine, choice pieces with marrow and refined aged wine. And on this mountain he will swallow up the covering which is over all the peoples, even the veil which is stretched over all nations. He will swallow up death for all time. And the Lord God will wipe tears away from all faces, and he will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. And it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God, for whom we have waited, that he might save us. This is the Lord, for whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. For the hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain, and Moab will be trodden down in his place. A straw is trodden down in the water, of a manure pile, and he will spread out his hands in the middle of it as a swimmer spreads out his hands to swim. But the Lord will lay low his pride together with the trickery of his hands. The unassailable fortifications of your walls he will bring down, lay low and cast to the ground, even to the dust. So it begins, God is exalted. O oh Lord, you are my God. This is a personal and intimate statement. The people of God will acknowledge within themselves intimately their love of their God, their Father, their King, their Savior, and they will rejoice because he has saved them, because he has preserved them. Uh, God's people have a reason to worship in end times. Now, you read chapter 24 and think there is no joy. All is gloom and doom. But for God's people, there is joy. There is worship. There is reason to have celebration because we belong to God and because God is our Savior and he has saved us. 
For the unrighteous deny him, but nothing but gloom and doom. For God's people who surrender to God, there's worship, there's celebration, there's joy. Uh, verses 1 through 5 are reasons to worship and praise. God has worked wonders the end times. He has put the enemy in their place. Uh, he has destroyed the enemy, verse 2 and 3. He has defended his people, protected his people, saved his people, lifted them up now and put them in a place of, of authority and power where they can worship God and celebrate. Uh, you have been a defense to the helpless, needy, and, and, and those in distress, it says. God is a refuge of, from the storm and from the heat, verses 4. Uh, the ruthless are defeated, verses 4 and 5. God intervenes for his people. He protects them. He provides for them. He lifts them up. He saves us. So his wrath is poured out. We are removed from that. We are set aside in his presence with him. Verse 6 through 9, God will save us. He prepares a banquet. He swallows up death, defeats death. He does that in Jesus. Verse 7. Verse 8, he will remove all tears and sin of the people. In verse 9, this is what the people of God have been waiting for, is the end. And, and think about that statement. Isn't that true? Aren't we waiting for Christ's return? Aren't we longing for Christ's return? To be done with all this pain and suffering and misery and mockery and persecution? It's hard to read headlines now. Things are so far gone. It's hard to watch anything on, on TV because now every TV show has got something gay or transgender in it. It's hard to enjoy any part of life anymore because the world has so come in on it to force sin and force perversion on us. I look forward to the time when it's all over and God returns. Once he returns and he takes us away, verses 10 and following, uh, the hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain and Moab will be trodden down in his place. What in the world is Moab doing here? Why is this put here? Why isn't it Babylon who began all this judgment and wrath, who said with their arrogance, yes, you are God and I will send over you the worst possible rejection of God. To not see as God and say I will rule over God as Satan did and was, it was punished accordingly. <laughs> Why is Moab stuck in here? And again, the commentators, it doesn't belong here. Some later are stuck in there for no apparent reason. I guess just ignore it and go on. However, if you put it in context, the context is Isaiah wrote to Jewish people, the Hebrews in Jerusalem and Judea, telling them the wrath of God is coming because of their sin, but his people will be saved. And in the end, the final end, his people are saved. And as an illustration of what that life will be like, Moab is mentioned. Well, why is Moab mentioned? And I think it's very clearly mentioned for a reason. In Numbers chapter 25, beginning in verse 1, the setting is Balak of Moab has sent for Balaam the prophet to come and curse the Israelites. And he tries multiple times, but God won't let Balaam curse the Israelites. Remember Balaam's mule talked to him? Same Balaam. Chapter 25 of Numbers, beginning in verse 1. While Israel remained in Shittim, the people began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. For they invited the people, Moab invited the Jews, to the sacrifices of their gods. And the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel joined themselves to Baal of Peor. And the Lord was angry against Israel. The Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of the people and execute them and brought them up before the Lord so that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. And that's what they did. But now turn to chapter 31 of Numbers. That's the event. And 31 gives an explanation of what has happened. 31 beginning in verse 13. Moses and Eliezer, the priest, and all the leaders of the congregation went out to meet them outside the camp. Moses was angry with the officers of the army, the captains of thousands, and the captains of hundreds who had come from the service in the war. They were fighting Moab and did not kill everyone as commanded. And Moses said to them, Have you spared all the women? Behold, these, the women, caused the sons of Israel through the council of Balaam, to trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. So the plague was among the congregation of the Lord. 
And here's the, here's the point that's being made here. Balaam told the king of Moab, if you want to destroy Israel, defeat Israel, send your women into their camp to seduce them. They will come after your women, marry your women, and then serve the gods of your women, and no more be a threat to you as the people of the one true God. It was a very sinister, <clears throat> behind-the-back, sneaky temptation to destroy Israel, to mislead Israel. To undercut what God was doing in Israel. Are you with me? It almost worked. It did not work because most of every person involved in that killed. Or God did. So when Moab is in Isaiah, the point is, when we are in heaven, when we are in the kingdom of Jesus, the thousand years and beyond, there will be no such temptation as that brought by Moab to the people of Israel in the wilderness. The point is, when I'm in heaven, there'll be no sneaky person hiding in the bushes waiting to pounce on me to lead me astray, cause me to make a mistake, or I'll point out my mistake. There'll be no temptation for any kind of sin whatsoever when Christ reigns. All of that is gone. When we are in heaven, when we are at one with God and Jesus in heaven and our final destination, there is no more temptation, no more sinister Satan lurking around to tempt us to with Eve in the Garden of Eden. There is no temptation whatsoever. There is going to be anything out there to cause me to think, is that a mistake? Did I sin? Did I fail God? There will be nothing out there to be standing on my shoulder tempting me to do something God does not want me to do. All of that is erased is destroyed, is history, is gone. And that's why Moab is put here. Because Moab wasn't an in-your-face temptation. Moab was a sinister, behind-your-back stealth sneaking into the camp of Israel to mislead them away from God. And the point is, God's making the point, nothing like that will exist in his kingdom when we get there. Now think about that for a minute. We go through our day... Do you think about temptation before it happens, while it's happening? It can rob you of your joy, of your peace. It can cause you to question where you stand before God. Is that wrong? Should I do that? Should I not do that? None of that exists in heaven. There's no such thing of if, if you will, or should I or should I not. We will know. It's all automatic. That should bring us some peace as well as some joy. I can freely live in heaven, go about my business all day long, and never once worry about, are you trying to stab me in the back? Are you trying to mislead me? Is Satan out here somewhere trying to tempt me to do something that's not right? None of that exists in heaven. And I think that's why Moab is mentioned here. It's the only reason Moab is mentioned here. They were never a threat to Israel. David conquered them and pretty much enslaved them from then on. Moab's never an issue except for that one time in the wilderness with Balaam when they tried to seduce them stealthily away from God. That no longer exists in God's kingdom. And for me, I'm, hallelujah. Because think about it. We have preachers who are very famous, who are very popular, who pastor large churches, and they say things you think, is that right? That's not in heaven. We will know exactly what is right and what is not right. All that is gone. Because Moab and all that Moab represents and that stealth temptation ceases to exist. I feel very strongly that Isaiah is despising end times. In 25, we will worship in end times. We will praise God because of what he has done and what he is doing, because of who he is, and because we are one with him. And in heaven, there is no temple because he is one with us. We are always in his presence. We are always with him. And that's what Isaiah is starting to describe. Uh, again, note the context. Uh, the world is being destroyed by the wrath of God. The whole world in chapter 24, but God's people have reason to rejoice because of God. Now, 26, 27, continue with that rejoicing, and we might do that next week or the next week. It depends how we do, how we decide to follow. Let's pray. And Father, we do thank you for the prophecy of Isaiah. I thank you, Father, for how you have laid Isaiah's prophecy out to lead us to this point of acknowledging the gloom and doom of our sin, our rebellion against you, our hopelessness without you, but then revealing to us, Father, the hope we have in you, in Jesus. You've conquered death, conquered sin. You've given us hope. You've given us life. You've given us eternity with you. And I pray, Father, you'll strengthen us and encourage us in that knowledge to seek you, to walk with you.
to want to be in your presence, to enjoy that, and to share that with the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>